What is Bitcoin finality? You can think of finality as the point in which a transaction is irreversible. And so when we say Stacks has Bitcoin finality, what we're saying is that it's as hard to reverse a Stack transaction as it would be a Bitcoin transaction. So how does that differ from being secured by Bitcoin? Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin Builders Breakdown. I'm your host, Kyle Elika, and today we're going to be diving into a technical subject, but also one that's very important, and that is talking about Bitcoin finality and also what it means for security around Bitcoin finality and specifically around stacks. Now, this is something that's being talked heavily about as we look towards the upcoming Nakamoto upgrade for the Stacks network. But regardless, this is an important topic, again, Bitcoin finality, for all to understand, no matter what particular network or layer you may be building in uh, as well. And that's why today I'm joined by an outstanding guest. Kenny, welcome. A quick intro for those who might not know you. Hey, yeah, thanks, Kyle. Uh, I'm Kenny. I'm the developer advocate at the Stacks Foundation. So I focus on developer education. I write tutorials, work on documentation, do events, workshops, that kind of thing. Awesome. And, and Kenny, let's jump right into it. But maybe before we cover Bitcoin finality, let's take a quick step back in time. You know, how does the Stacks network uh, in particular work today pre Nakamoto? So pre Bitcoin finality? Yeah, so the way that Stacks works today is the terminology generally used, which a lot of people have probably heard, is secured by Bitcoin. And so what that really means is that whenever a Stacks block is produced on the Stacks chain, what happens is a hash of all of the data included in that Stacks block is then written directly to the Bitcoin chain. And that happens in lockstep with Bitcoin blocks. So right now, Stacks blocks operate and get produced one-to-one -one with Bitcoin blocks. Every time that happens, the data from the block is hashed and written to the chain. So you have this perpetual history of Stacks transactions that are all written to the Bitcoin chain. But what Stacks can do right now is that Stacks can fork separately from Bitcoin. And what this really means is that what's called the security budget, which is basically the economic power that it would take in order to facilitate a 51% attack on a chain, you can do that by only overpowering Stacks miners. You don't necessarily need to conduct a 51% attack on Bitcoin miners in order to fork the Stacks chain. You would in order to rewrite the history, but if you can fork and basically create your own canonical version of the Stacks chain, then you kind of have your own chain to go forward with. And that right now is only tied to the stack security budget, not necessarily the Bitcoin security budget. Got it. And when we talk about Bitcoin finality, for those that may be new into this space, what is Bitcoin finality? What is finality uh, means in terms of a network? Yeah, so this is a little one of those terms that people have different definitions of, but generally how I like to think about it, and I think what is a relatively agreed upon version of it is you can think of finality as the point in which a transaction is irreversible. And so when we say Bitcoin finality, what we're saying is that it is at, is as hard to reverse a transaction as it would be a Bitcoin transaction. So when we say Stacks has Bitcoin finality, what we're saying is that it's as hard to reverse a Stacks transaction transaction as it would be a Bitcoin transaction. So how does that differ from being secured by Bitcoin? Well, it really comes down to that ability to fork on its own. So if I'm on the pre-Nakamoto Stacks, if I'm a malicious miner and I manage to get 51% of the power of the of uh, Stacks mining, what I can do is I can create my own Stacks fork and then I can rewrite the history of that particular fork without needing to rewrite the history of Bitcoin transactions. The previous history will still be there, but it's a different fork that's not progressing forward, so it doesn't really matter. When we talk about Bitcoin finality, what we're saying is that Stacks does not fork on its own anymore, which means that once a Stacks transaction has been settled to Bitcoin, there is no way to remove that transaction other than reversing the Bitcoin transaction itself. And how that works out in practice is that Stacks miners are going to be required to build upon a single canonical Stacks chain tip. They can't produce blocks that start up a separate fork. They have to build on this one agreed upon canonical chain tip, which then prevents that backtracking. Even if I am a malicious Stacks miner that overpowers that, that doesn't matter. I still can't go back and reverse those transactions like I can today. Got it. So when we look at post Nakamoto, so the Nakamoto upgrade uh, that gets rolled out and deployed, what exactly happens with an individual transaction from beginning to end 
Uh, so before and then after finality as we look towards the Nakamoto upgrade. Yeah, so one of the key differences that Nakamoto will bring where pre-Nakamoto, the responsibility for block production was solely on miners. What's going to happen now is that the responsibility for producing, validating, and then confirming transactions and blocks is going to be split between miners and stackers. Mm-hmm. So we'll start with the miners. If I'm a miner in pre-Nakamoto stacks, what that means is that I'm in charge of writing a single stacks block that works in lockstep with a single Bitcoin block. Post-Nakamoto, if I'm a miner, what that means is that I get selected to be a miner for a tenure of a length of one Bitcoin block, which is, let's just say, for argument's sake, is about 10 minutes. So that means that I'm a miner for 10 minutes. But that doesn't mean that I'm only producing a single block. What's actually going to happen is I'm going to be producing several stacks blocks within that tenure, which is a length of a Bitcoin block, on the order of roughly five seconds. That's my role as the miner. Then from there, what happens is those blocks get sent over to stackers and signers, who will then basically validate that those blocks are legitimate. And that's where we get back to the fact that a miner is required to build on this canonical chain tip. If these stackers see that this miner is trying to build on a different chain tip, they will just reject those blocks and they won't be considered valid at all. So that's part of what presents the forking. So the transactions start, the blocks start with the miners. Miner produces them, proposes them really. They get sent to the stacker signers for um, validation. If they approve those, then they get confirmed to the stacks chain first. And so this basically happens in two stages where during this tenure, we will have all of these stacks transactions and blocks that get produced about every five seconds. Those will get confirmed to the stacks chain on that order of every five seconds or so. And then what will happen is when the miner changes tenure to the next miner, Part of that process is they have to then take all of that data and hash it and write that back to the Bitcoin chain. But now there's a second hash that also happens, what's called, I think it's being called the index block hash. But what that basically means is they are not only going to hash the data of that, of the blocks from their specific tenure, they're actually going to hash the data of everything that has happened up until then. So that's how we keep track of what is that canonical chain tip. And then that information then gets passed on to um, the signers and the stackers and the next miner, and they have, are required to build off of that chain tip there using that information. Wow. Okay. So it's a multi-step process, as you said. Multiple parties are involved. Uh, you mentioned validating transactions. Is there a uh, walk us through the situation if an invalid transaction may occur or, or could an invalid transaction occur in this new process post Nakamoto? Yeah, so invalid transactions can still occur. And basically what would happen then is the signers signers and stackers would just reject that transaction. Or uh, let's say on the block level, if they've tried to propose an invalid block, they would just reject that transaction. And then what happens is there are fallback mechanisms in place where if a miner is trying to propose invalid transactions or invalid blocks, stacker signers will reject it. The miner can continue to propose valid blocks, but those invalid blocks are just not going to be added to the chain. And then um, once the miner's tenure is over, then it gets switched to the new miner and they can basically start the same process over. But those, that's what this, we have this collaborative relationship between the miners and the stackers where they both only get their economic reward if they are doing the right thing. And so if a miner is continually proposing invalid blocks, then they're not going to get any of their rewards for you know producing those new blocks. If the stackers and signers aren't doing their job validating these blocks, then they don't get their proof of transfer rewards. So we have this sort of symbiotic relationship where they're both checking each other to make sure that only valid blocks are being produced. And if that's not happening, then they don't get their rewards. Got it. And so what is the benefit of being secured on Bitcoin in terms of finality versus, say, Ethereum, Solana, or many of the other networks and protocols that are out there? Yeah, I think this really comes down to how you view the specific consensus models and security models of the different chains. So if you look at proof of work, one of the differences between proof of work and proof of stake is that if I'm a malicious miner and we're hypothetically able to get 51% uh, hash power over the Bitcoin network, that doesn't mean that I can just instantly and unilaterally create an entire new version of Bitcoin because we have to have the proof of work in place in order for the chain to be considered valid, which means that I can start trying to reorg the chain one block at a time, but I still have to put in the continuous hash power in order to remine that. And the further back I get, the more difficult that gets. 
Well, that entire time, other miners can be coming online trying to basically fight me and get control of the chain back into the hands of the decentralized network. <clears throat> what happens with other chains like Ethereum that use proof of stake <clears throat> is if I get control of the um, staking power, which in the example that I'm talking about, I'd have to have 66% of the staking power in order to do this. Well, as soon as I get that 66% of staking power, I can't change the rules of the chain itself. Like the chain still has rules for valid transactions and valid blocks. But what I can do is I can do whatever I want to the transaction in the block history, as long as those transactions are valid. So I can double spend as much as I want if I do that. Right now, we have a situation where Lido controls more than 33% of the stake. And those are kind of the two thresholds in proof of stake, 33%, 66%. If I control 33%, I don't have the power to rewrite uh, block or transaction history. But at this point, the liveness of Ethereum depends on Lido functioning correctly, because if they cross that 33% threshold where they lose 33% of their validators, chain halts. And then if you up that to the 66%, that's where you can just unilaterally create a new, a new chain, basically, with a new transaction history. And there's no real way to recover that except for just social governance, hoping that the community steps up and does what does the right thing, basically. And so with Bitcoin, you have this, it's more of a, it's more of an actual fight, I guess, for lack of a better term, where if I'm a malicious miner, I cannot just instantly rewrite the transaction history. And so in my mind, Bitcoin offers the most secure guarantees when it comes to finality. And there are lots of arguments, very good arguments, back and forth on both sides of these things, but that's kind of my perspective on it. So as a developer, you know, why is this important? If I'm building an application and looking at maybe what network to build on, uh, and I see a network or two that has this type of finality uh, towards the Bitcoin network, you know, what's in its importance? Why is this something I should be concerned about when developing my application? Yeah, I think to best answer that, we need to go back to, you know, why are we building this technology in the first place? And the in my mind, the whole point of building this is to provide economic freedom for people that otherwise wouldn't have it. And so that's kind of the lens that I'm coming at this from. And the reason that this perpetual history and ledger is so important is because that it makes that immutable and centralized entities can't come in and mess with it. And so in my mind, if I'm a builder and I want to build a decentralized application for this, I want to make it as 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 much as possible i want to make it impossible in order to rewrite that history and so i'm going to choose to build on the chain that has the most likelihood of that happening now i know we have to take into consideration things like user experience and transaction speed and ease of use and all these things those do matter and that's kind of where i view layer twos like stacks coming in is bridging that gap between we have this extremely secure final bitcoin but then on the stack side, how do we then bring that into a platform and a system that also brings in those those more user-friendly experiences like the fast transaction times and the smart contracts, everything like that? So as a developer of an application, is there anything I need to do when building an application on stacks and being able to take advantage of Bitcoin finality and the security around it? Or is that already baked in when I start building my application? Yeah, once Nakamoto comes out, um, you it'll that'll just be how it works. So when I'm writing a Clarity smart contract as a developer, um, the one thing that will change with how developers interact with it is a lot of applications will use uh, block times as a way to measure and set constraints based on time. So you can't really measure time in a blockchain like you can in a centralized system. And so what you have to do is you have to sort of use the block times as a proxy for that. And so that'll change a little bit, but there's be, there's new primitives being introduced in Clarity to where you will be able to basically get the tenure uh, time, which is that 10 minutes. That's what Clarity developers are going to be used to. But then you'll also have the block time um, from the stacks blocks, which are going to be, you know, five-ish seconds. And so uh, there will be a little bit of a shift in how to, which one of those to use, but the primitives will still be there to do both the longer 10-minute Bitcoin block times and the faster five-second uh, stacks block times. But other than that, um, everything's going to be kind of built into the system already. And so if you're a Clarity developer, you can just continue building your applications and making your Clarity code. There's going to be some some surface level changes to probably some some UIs that might use some JavaScript and everything just because things are going to be a lot more responsive. So we may have to bake in some changes there. Um, but but that's really it. Most of the heavy lifting is, is kind of handled on the system side of things. And Kenny, 
For those that uh, may be looking to build their first application, are there good resources or developer guides to point towards uh, for them to begin their journey as building up to the Nakamoto upgrade uh, later this year? Yeah, so I think the three places I'd probably send somebody, depending on where you're at in your journey, are if you're brand new to building on Bitcoin, I'd probably send you to the Bitcoin Primer, uh, bitcoinprimer.dev. That's going to be a course that's going to kind of give you a high level overview of what it looks like and what it means to build on Bitcoin, especially using Stacks as an L2. It's a lot different than building on something like Ethereum and Solidity, and it's definitely a lot different than building like a standard Web2 application. So if you're new to this whole building on Bitcoin, that's the first place I'd send you. If you're new to Stacks and you want to see how Stacks works, I think the best place right now to go is just the docs, and those are just at docs.stacks.co. That'll give you an overview to how it all works. Um, we're putting up a new section on Nakamoto right now. There's a sort of a smaller version up right now, but we're going to be adding some more details to that soon. There's a quick start tutorial that I kind of introduce you to the whole ecosystem of tools. Uh, Hero makes a bunch of really good stuff like Stacks.js that you're going to want to be familiar with. And then if you're specifically looking at, I just want to build Clarity Smart Contracts, then I'd probably send you to the Clarity book. And the best place to go for that would be clarity-lang.org to get to the book. Perfect. Lang being L-A-N-G. Yep, L-A-N-G dot org. Perfect. Awesome. Kenny, where can everyone find you if they'd like to connect more, ask questions, or read one of your great uh, many threads on not just stacks, but uh, building within the decentralized application and industry as a whole? And my Twitter handle is Ken the Rogers. So K-E-N-T-H-E-R-O-G-E-R-S is probably the best place to follow me. Uh, people are also welcome to email me at kenny at stacks.org. And then I'm pretty active on Discord. Uh, Bitcoin Primer was also created by me. So if you go in there, um, you'll automatically be CC'd on an email to me, uh, kind of introducing you to the course. Wonderful. Well, Kenny, thank you so much for, again, explaining the basics of uh, Secure by Bitcoin Finality to our viewers today. And to all of you, thank you for tuning in to another edition of Bitcoin Builders Breakdown. I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott. And until next time, Take care.